Fantastic. Thanks for the thumbs up. That helps me. All right. So uh, we left off talking about starfish, which was cool because that was further in our notes than I had kind of anticipated us getting. So I was pretty happy about that. Um, sorry, going way too far. Holy moly. Here we go. We left off talking about two feet. And this idea that, sorry, my camera's like cutting the top of my head off. Not like that really makes a huge difference. Um, with this idea that basically starfish were stronger than clams because clams were holding their shells shut with a muscle and starfish were using a water vascular system where they could use their tube feet to suction onto this clam, start to pump water out of their backs and draw this kind of negative pressure against that clam shell and the more water they pump the stronger the vacuum essentially and they can slowly 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 pull apart this clam and and eat it which is a really cool way to get around um it's very 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 powerful uh which is which is just super neat because uh starfish are neat i guess so that's tube feet and that's a water vascular system um the tube feet go to a water canal and uh, the water canal goes along the starfish rays and eventually to the central disc. So I'll try to draw this for you. It, it won't be pretty, but essentially here's your starfish. He has a circular disc in his body. You can't see this, this is on the inside. Now we'll try for five arms, probably won't be particularly beautiful, but that's okay. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's the worst starfish in the world. Anyways, all of these little tube feet down here are connected to a canal. That canal runs to his central disc. And then he can pump water. We'll draw some more tube feet because they're on every single leg, right? Or arm is what they're actually called. Then a canal. And as he pumps that water out, hold on a second. Here we go. Here's blue. As he pumps that water out of his back, he creates pressure drawing into those tube feet. And that's going to be how he's gonna move, grip rocks, grip prey, that kind of stuff. And this is unique uh, really to starfish. We don't see this in other invertebrates and uh, it's, it's really a fascinating um, mechanism for being uh, basically very, very, very strong and not having much in the way of muscles. Now the central ring also, since we're here and have drawn this terrible starfish, you've probably heard that if you cut a starfish in half, you can regenerate a new starfish. And that is actually true. This central disc right here also has a ring of nerves. And so that we can say is basically the starfish brain. And it also houses the major digestive organ. And they're all organized in a circle. And so as long as, if you were to cut this starfish like this, I don't think you'd be very happy, but let's say you did. You cut him like this. As long as the piece you cut off of him has central disc attached he's got nerves he's got digestive organs he's got a water vascular system odds are pretty good he'll be able to regenerate and so that's why starfish can regenerate if they're cut in half is because of that radial symmetry which is really really cool i don't know if you could push it and you know cut him like that and give him some central disc and cut him like that and give him some central disc and you know keep going until you get five starfish i don't I, I, that might just kill him. I don't know. I've never done it. It sounds a little sad, but it's a cool idea that they can regenerate if they have some central disc left, which I think is, is really, really neat. Um, there is a sieve plate on top. Uh, the dorsal surface means back. So the side of the surface, uh, the top of it, if you would, if you're looking down into the sea and you see him, um, then that's going to be a sieve plate, uh, which is basically going to be really, really small pores that allow water to get through. Um, if you've ever heard the expression leaking like a sieve, um, that's like, just think the strainer that you use to get the water off of noodles when you're making spaghetti, that's essentially a sieve, right? And so the idea is there's these itty bitty teeny tiny holes that aren't going to let, uh, you know, debris and parasites and things from the ocean get into that starfish's body, but will allow the starfish to pump water out of his back. And that's the sieve plate. So just imagine like a tiny screen. And you've basically got the idea. Uh, we already talked about them varying water pressure. We talked about them moving and grabbing things and all of these just cool things that they can do with this water vascular system. Um, some starfish use tube feet to pry open clams and oysters, which we've talked about. And I have a picture for you uh, in just a minute. One of the cool things about starfish is their very odd, odd way 
of consuming and digesting food, we're pretty familiar with this idea that, you know, you, you get a whatever, you know, algae, moss, dirt, whatever, and you put it in the mouth, uh, goes to another space like a pharynx or crop, esophagus, something like that, and down to another bag that holds it like a stomach, intestine, or crop, right? That's the way we've eaten everything. Starfish, a whole different animal, okay? They'll pry open the clam. <clears throat> when a clam is open, they will push the clam into essentially the essential disc. And then they will push their stomach out of their body. The starfish will, not the clam. The starfish pushes his stomach outside of his body, kind of envelops the clam in this bag and starts to secrete digestive enzymes onto that clam and digest him out of his shell, basically. Um, when the pieces are small enough and he's digested enough, the starfish, who's not in a big hurry, he can't move quickly anyway, and he's got nowhere to go because all of his arms are being used to hold this clam in. The starfish will take that uh, clam into his stomach, fold the stomach back into his central disc, let go of the empty shell and continue crawling around the ocean, uh, which is which is pretty incredible and just weird way to eat. So we don't need a radula. Uh, we don't need teeth. We don't need a beak. All of these things that we've looked at in, you know, earthworms and cuttlefish and octopus and squid, whole different design here. He doesn't use any of those things, uh, which is pretty cool. But he uses digestive enzymes. He uses intestine. He uses stomach, that kind of stuff and uh, to eat his food, which is, which is really something. And so this is a pretty cool picture, but this person has found a starfish. They picked him up. Uh, here you can see the bony plates, right, that support his body and keep him safe. Underneath, right in the middle, you can see these are all of his tube feet that he uses to move and grab prey. And right in the middle here is a clam. And he has that clam just wedged into his central disc. You can see the clam is pried open and he is digesting and taking in this clam broth and he's just about done. He's not at a point where he's let go of it yet, but he's really close. And so that's kind of the end of him consuming that clam, which is, I think is pretty weird kind of out there. Uh, here's what that stomach looks like. Here's a starfish who's pushed his stomach outside of his body. It's this kind of opaque bag. You can sort of see through it here. And it's got all these little folds and convolutions in it. So you can see that it's kind of uh, like there's a cavity in here where it's going to sort of be able to like fold in and wrap around um, its food, which is kind of a cool, kind of a cool way to eat. So very, very different design, but it, it does get the job done. Um, so uh, let's talk about respiration. Uh, we haven't talked about gills or lungs yet. Uh, starfish have a, a very, very strange and small way of, uh, occur of, of doing respiration, which is to bring oxygen in, get carbon dioxide out. And respiration and excretion both have to occur between the coelom, which is the body cavity, and the environment, which is the ocean. Uh, the coelom, we've talked about acelomates and coelomates. Basically, it's the body cavity. We saw it in clams. We've seen it in earthworms. We mentioned that some of these invertebrates didn't have a coelom, but what I really want you to know from this side, uh, sorry, this slide is skin gills. Skin gills are these itty bitty, teeny tiny white dots in between the spines that are keeping this starfish safe. So the big spiny plates and ossicles, that's what keeps the starfish safe from predators but tucked in between those are these little itty bitty white polka dots and those are skin gills and skin gills are going to do just what gills would do in a fish, right? Uh, they're going to be a, a very large surface area available. The water hits that uh, gill, oxygen moves into the gill, carbon dioxide moves out of the gill. The oxygen is then put into the bloodstream and is circulated throughout the starfish. Uh, carbon dioxide is released to the ocean and, you know, can be taken up by algae or something like that. Uh, but that's a, a really just a weird, weird way to breathe. But it works for them. So that's kind of the, the picture here is kind of get that picture of the, the very, very diverse body plans that, that God's made. It's crazy. Uh, here's a itty bitty sieve plate, which is kind of cool. 
I don't know if you say it's Seaver's sieve. I feel bad if I'm saying this wrong, but uh, there you have it. So the sieve plate, uh, obviously water is going to flow out of this because we're looking at the starfish's back when he wants to create that pressure on his, I guess we should probably call it his ventral side, would be his belly side. So his ventral side must create pressure there. He's pumping water out of his dorsal side, which is his back. And that's what the sieve plate is for. And so there's a lot there. It's funny because you look at it, it's like, well, it's a bumpy starfish. I guess it's bumps. <laughs> and then it's like, well, holy moly. It's not. It's protection and respiration and, and creating water pressure. And holy moly, there's a lot going on there. So kind of a, kind of a cool organism. All right. Uh, let's see. Skin gills will also function to excrete some waste, uh, which is a little bit odd. So you can sort of think of them as almost doing the job of a kidney for the starfish. Kind of a neat design. It's definitely uh, a little bit odd, but tends to get the job done. Now, here's the really odd part. There's amoebocytes in starfish, and we have not talked about amoebocytes since, uh, sorry, not coral. Goodness gracious. Sponges sponges had amoebocytes and those were cells that were free moving freely crawling throughout the body of you know the sponge and they did everything like reproduction digestion moving food moving waste because the sponge just sat there and amoebocytes they were like we will be your bloodstream and excretory system and reproductive system and we'll just do everything for you and that's what amoebocytes did in, in sponges and we didn't see them again all the way up through flatworms, roundworms, echinoderms, you know, and then, oh my goodness, here's amoebocytes again. They are going to only do a couple of jobs for starfish, but primarily they're going to get waste and carry the waste out to the skin gills. That's what amoebocytes are going to be doing. So you can kind of think of them essentially as the excretory system for the starfish. If you know that starfish and sponges both have amoebocytes, I'm happy with that. I mean, that's great. That's really cool. So that's what I kind of want you to know for that. Now, uh, as when we talk about the reproductive systems, because we got to go through all the body systems, uh, these guys do have separate sexes. They are no longer hermaphroditic. We've talked about a lot of hermaphroditic critters lately, uh, especially in the flatworms and roundworms. Everything was a hermaphrodite. They had both female and male functioning reproductive organs. And now we get to a point where we have a separate male starfish and a separate me uh, female starfish, which is pretty cool. So they're going to reproduce much the same way the coral do. The males expel sperm into the ocean water. The females expel eggs into the ocean water and they hope or think that the gametes will basically find each other, swim to each other, if you will. And when they get to each other, they produce a zygote. Uh, the zygote becomes a ciliated larva. Sorry, all of my underlining is like getting little wiggles in it. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the zygote develops into a ciliated larva, uh, which you've seen before with the starfish, medusa, and polyp. All they would have started as a teeny tiny ciliated larva that swam away, found a place to land, became a polyp, and became Medusa. So you've actually seen the ciliated larva before. Go around and the larva settles to the ocean floor, grows into an adult starfish, and starts crawling around, slowly gathering food and stuff. Does that kind of make sense? Questions over any of those body systems? Feel okay about them? Big difference. Amoebocytes and skin gills. Like those are big, big differences. Um, so there's a nerve ring. You've already seen my terrible drawing of it, but the nerve ring is essentially the starfish's brain if it had a brain. The starfish do not have a very impressive brain. They do have a nerve ring. It's a circle around the mouth and around that central disc that is gathering information. Uh, I just kind of assumed you knew this. I don't know if I told you this. I should have. I'm sorry. Nerves send electrochemical impulses to your brain from your body to tell you about your environment and to respond to it. I just kind of assumed you knew that. And, and that's a dumb assumption on my part. Uh, if you, well, that's a dumb example. We can't step on a nail. That would be processed in your spinal cord. Um, if you get too hot, that's processed in your brain. You get too hot. You have nerves in your skin cells that are going to transmit a signal to your spinal cord, which is more nerves, which transmit it to your brain, which is more nerves that says we are hot. The brain processes that information with more nerves, which sends signals, electrochemical signals with more nerves to sweat glands in your skin. The sweat glands then produce sweat. The sweat evaporatively cools off and you become cooler. That's what nerves do. I should have said that earlier and I apologize. 
nerves transmit electrochemical signals to and from a main processing center like spinal cord or brain to let an organism know what is going on in its environment or to let the organism respond to that change. So if you didn't know what a nerve was, now you know. You tell your younger siblings, you know, you're getting on my nerves. They're causing you to respond to your environment. So now we know that. Uh, not surprising to you, this central ring of neurons, of nerves, extends nerves into the rays, right? The rays are his arms. And so obviously, if the starfish bumps into something that could be a rock or could be food, he should be able to feel that to, you know, make a decision like, holy moly, I found a clam. I can't believe it because I don't have eyes. Hooray for me. And take that clam in and consume it. So obviously, each nerve runs to each ray. Hey, buddy, I'm doing a Zoom meeting. Is your mom home? No. No? Okay, go watch a movie. I don't want to watch. No, go. Go. All right. That was my son. He's eight. His name's James. All right. Uh, coordinates movements of tube feet, uh, of course, right? I mean, you must coordinate movements of your feet to walk. So tube feet must be coordinated for this starfish to move effectively um, and bring sensory information in from the rays. So lets him know uh, what's going on with his environment or her. We can say that now that it's not a hermaphrodite. Hooray. Okay. Uh, regeneration is what we kind of talked about. If you were mean and cut a starfish in half, which I guess would be fine. Go ahead and do that if you like. Uh, a single ray. So one arm. One arm can grow into a full adult as long as you give it some central disc. It's got to have some nerves. It's got to have some digestive organs to start. But if you wanted to, you know, slice him up into arm and a central disc chunk, the idea is that they can regenerate from just that, which is, uh, holy moly, pretty impressive because that's five starfish from one starfish uh, most of the time, sometimes more arms than that. So that's regeneration. As far as asexual reproduction, I can't imagine that they would regenerate that often in the wild. I mean, I don't think there's organisms in the ocean that go around biting starfish in half and leaving both chunks lie there so they can regenerate. And I can't imagine there's too many jerk kids running around with knives doing it. So uh, I don't know. Sexual reproduction is probably going to be their most effective method of increasing their numbers. I think, but I don't know much about the ocean because you know me. I'm not an ocean guy. Okay, so here we go. Uh, problem. Starfish do cause some ecological problems. Uh, just like anything in an ecosystem, they have predators and they have prey. And you already know that they eat clams and oysters. A, a healthy, quick-moving starfish can eat 12 a day, right? Uh, which doesn't seem like a lot unless you have hundreds of thousands of starfish in the ocean. Uh, that's a lot of clams and oysters they're eating every day. Some will actually eat the young coral polyps before they have a chance to really get that strong skeletonized stone cup. They'll eat the babies. And if they do that and your starfish numbers are extensive, then you might have a problem establishing enough young coral polyps to actually get a good population growing and uh, they can cause that coral reef to diminish or die, which is a, a bad thing. Um, some places starfish are growing kind of out of control because the predators of starfish have been, you know, caught, uh, fished commercially, that kind of stuff. And so the things that you're going to see eating starfish are going to be some sharks. They'll eat starfish, manta rays, which are honestly basically just a shark anyway. And then Alaskan king crabs will also eat starfish. And uh, we like to fish for king crabs. If you've ever seen that silly show on the Discovery Channel, I shouldn't say that. Don't sue me, Discovery Channel. I'm sure your show is great. Like they're going to see my YouTube video, right? Um, and so those guys are eating the starfish. So, you know, we catch, we catch sharks for sport, fun, shark fin soup. Uh, we catch manta rays, sport fun, you know, et cetera. And Alaskan king crabs, we catch and sell pretty extensively. So uh, those starfish predators, if they're not around, the starfish population can explode. And uh, when you get an imbalance in the ecosystem, things get a little bit weird. So uh, we do have about three minutes left. And I think we can talk about sea urchins for three minutes. Um, I like to joke, it's my wife's least favorite souvenir from Jamaica <laughs> because she went running in the ocean and stepped on a sea urchin. And I was like, that's weird. How'd you get a sliver from the ocean? Cause you know, I'm from South Dakota. I don't know what's in the ocean, I guess fish. And uh, I'm like, how'd you get a sliver from the ocean? And she's like, I don't know, but it's pretty small. We'll leave it in and uh, it'll come out. And 
we go all the way back to, you know, the, the South Dakota and it is sliver still in, sliver still in. And she's like, I think it's a sea urchin spine. I was like, I think you're right. But there were like 12 of them. And we picked them out one by one. And those little suckers are hard to get out. I was surprised by that. Like they, they're like brittle. So when you get them with like a tweezer, they break. You got to dig more then they break. You got to dig more. And it was like, oof like excavation but anyways whatever she's got a great foot now uh so that's the ocean why i'm afraid of it and everything in it uh sea urchins and sand dollars are some echinoderms echinoderms and uh these guys as long as you know the sea urchin and sand dollar you don't have to spell these words up here right it's fine i don't worry about class but uh most people know sea urchins um they have a bad reputation of you know poking people in the foot and being dangerous and that kind of stuff like that there's all these dumb urban legends that you should pee on your foot when you get stuck no you shouldn't that's a terrible idea but uh you know i guess do what you need to do uh don't pee on your foot that's stupid advice but it's pretty funny so i can definitely see why some islanders might want to make that joke for tourists i think that's hilarious anyways they have long spines that cover their entire body obviously it's to deter predators right um, they're eating any organic material they can get. Uh, there is a fish that will eat these guys, and it's called the damselfish. And the damselfish will very patiently bite off every single spine on a sea urchin. And when it has bitten off every single spine, then it will go ahead and crack the sea urchin open and eat its soft inner core out. Uh, they are seriously spherically symmetrical and they're a lot like a starfish as far as digestive organs and that kind of stuff are concerned. Uh, you can also eat them, I guess. I don't know if I would, but I guess it's an option. So with that, it is 2.30. Uh, so I do want to open it up for 